appreciate everybody um, sticking around. Um, we've got a great panel coming up. You know, one thing we were talking about in the, the last, um, uh, that the congressman and, um, and Rachel were mentioned, is how um, much you see kind of the economy improving. Um, and there are just some like tremendously positive um, numbers coming out. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the, the latest data and the Department of Labor was reporting that, you know, the number of women employed in March reached an all-time high. Um, our unemployment rate is below um, 4%, which is the lowest it's been in 17 years. We have women starting businesses. Um, we have, um, uh, in 2017, over 1.4 million Americans stopped receiving food stamps. And I feel like you have so much positive news, but what we know is that we need more of that. We need um, you know continue to take the next steps. We want people to um, not just be able to participate, but thrive in the economy. And that's gonna take um, some continued reforms to give people new opportunities. And that's what this panel is gonna be focusing on. And I really appreciate our three panelists. I'm gonna kind of make this a conversation and I'm gonna introduce them one at a time and we'll just talk about some of their areas of, of expertise. And I first I wanna welcome Jenny Massey, who's, um, thank you so much for being here. She is the Senior Manager of Public Policy at Amazon. So um, I'm really interested to, to hear some of your um, thoughts on this. Obviously, the explosion of technology has, you know, this is something that um, Rachel was just talking about. It's changed so much of how we experience work and the, the kind of opportunities that we have to participate in the economy. Um, but I know that, that um, it's also been, this is one of the big drivers of business creation. So I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about that and some of, of your experience. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Carrie, thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to be here on behalf of Amazon because I think we've got some really innovative things that we've been doing, not only just in technology, but also with our workforce structure that will resonate. But also, I am myself a working mom, so I love to get in a room full of women. I think we learn so much from each other when we network together. So let me get that out of the way cool, and say yeah. thank you. Um, you mentioned um, women entrepreneurs, and I'd like to touch on that first, if I may, because I think one thing that people don't realize about Amazon is about half of all the products you see on Amazon.com come from small and medium businesses. And we released a report last week, um, a small business impact report. We now have over a million businesses that are on Amazon.com in all 50 states. And a lot of these, uh, we have some really great stories of women-owned businesses. And I encourage people to go on YouTube. There are a couple really great um, uh, stories that we've pulled together for uh, Mother's Day. Um, let me just sh share a couple with you here. Lucy Luz, which is um, by a stay-at-home mom who does um, graphic design and all sorts of um, cool wall structures for nurseries in your home. Um, she works out of her home in rural Idaho and has been able to reach a global consumer population um, by going on Amazon. There's also a great story about um, Sarah Bach, who has Sarah Bach Pottery. She had this dream of being a studio artist, but never thought she would be able to pursue that and have a family, and has been able to, um, to work from home and um, have the marketplace of Amazon.com. So, um, you know, we talk about technology and the internet and what it does for opportunities and flexibility for women, and, and it's a, a whole new frontier. Well, that's, you know, it really is. It's funny. It's amazing. It's something that I hadn't realized until I started reading about, um, about some of your, your um, stuff is because I do think you think of this as a big business, but what you realize is that how many um, truly small micro businesses that there are out there. But can you, is there, you know, what is, so we're, as we're looking at, we see what like technology is making possible. Are there changes that you see or what kind of reforms might be able to encourage that progress to continue? Do you sure. feel like there's still barriers out there to more women getting involved? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I've been in working in labor policy for 17 years, and I think that the one frustration I would say here with um, laws is our labor laws are really outdated, and they're not, they haven't been, they don't accommodate the current technology that we have. I think what we have seen in a company like Amazon is that there's organic change that happens to help um, individuals with workforce structure or benefits. Um, one example of this I think that will be of interest here is that we had um, a change in our parental leave plan um, last year that started organically with a group of women within Amazon, um, women in engineering, um, group of women got together and talked about um, what their ideal parental leave would be and did something called write a press release, which is what we do at Amazon, you know, finish, show us what the finished product looks like and then work backwards from that um, in order to design it. And they did and they took it up to leadership and Jeff Bezos signed off on it last year and it has three hallmark pieces of it. One is the, um, the actual leave, which is 16 weeks of leave. There's the flexible um, come back to work schedule that you can create as a, as a result, you know, so you don't have this jolt 
um, when you are going back to work. And then really the game changer that I think um, uh, we're getting a lot of really positive um, feedback from our employees is a leave share. So 16 weeks, say I take 12, but my husband doesn't have the same type of leave. Well, Amazon will pay for him to take wow. the four weeks of leave. Understanding how important it is to have um, support for the whole family, not just for the, the mom in the situation. Um, and an example of how we can do this without necessarily government mandates, but listening to employee demands. Oh, well, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's amazing. You know, and I'm going to use that. I'm going to come back to you as we get into um, some of the other conversations. When we talk to education, I know you guys are doing, um, have some, are working on some education things that are really interesting too. But since we just brought up paid leave, I'm going to <laughs> switch things up a little bit. And I'm going to turn to Kristen, because Kristen is um, IWS, a visiting fellow with us. And she's the author of our January policy focus on a new approach to paid leave. So Kristen, first, can you kind of give us a little bit of background information? Because I think that, um, that when you talk about paid leave, one of the, the big challenges we have is that there's a lot of misconceptions about um, this, the kind of um, the foundation of paid leave in America. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, so starting with the employer level, more and more companies like Amazon are coming up with innovative solutions uh, every day. A common statistic that uh, will be passed around, particularly by Democrats, is that you know, only 15% of people have access to paid parental or, or family leave. Um, but that is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it pretty much woefully undercounts the amount of people who actually already have access to paid leave through their employers, uh, because it doesn't count, you know, like, for example, I'm on maternity leave right now, and a lot of that is accrued vacation days, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't count that. So when you actually look at the numbers, it's about two-thirds of people who took uh, paid family leave or parental leave in the last year were paid uh, by their employers. Uh, where you see it kind of the most noticeable gap is among low-income people. Uh, who, you know, really struggle to get by often uh, during, you know, times when they, you know, right after they have a kid and need to be home. Um, about, of people who lack access to paid leave, about 17% of them go on public assistance, and that number reaches almost 50% for uh, low-income individuals. Um, so, but because there has been such progress, you know, in the employer area, I think it's important, you know, to keep that in mind so that any policies uh, by state and local governments don't displace uh, what is happening on, at the employer level. So, uh, briefly, in terms of the policies um, at the state level, about five states, five states in the District of Columbia have passed uh, paid family leave legislation. Uh, it's funded, you know, through a pay increase in payroll tax. Um, and the majority of the remaining states are actually considering, uh, you know, passing something similar. Uh, at the federal level, we don't have any paid parental or family leave policy. There is the FMLA, which guarantees 12 weeks of unpaid leave to qualifying employees. Uh, about 60% of people work for an employer that, you know, is, bu is bound by the FMLA. Um, there is a proposal uh, on the Democratic side, the Family Act, which would uh, offer 12 weeks of paid leave uh, to individuals that would, like all of the legislation we've been seeing at the states, uh, be funded through a uh, payroll tax. Uh, and we're going to probably see more and more development uh, because it's a very popular issue. A majority of uh, Democrats and Republicans support paid family and parental leave. Yeah, well that's really interesting. I think it's important to kind of have that as a, um, you know, and I think at IWF for a long time we were kind of warning about the problems associated with kind of the big government approach coming in with a new entitlement program. We know that a, a payroll tax is really regressive. It takes money out of the hands of, of um, people who need it, um, gives them less money to spend on their own, and then it also does, you create a new government program, it, it, um, it means that companies, um, you know, might be less likely to say, okay, government's doing this, let's forget this, and you could, a lot of people could end up with less generous programs. So can you talk a little bit about, Kristen came to, um, came to IWF. We've been encouraging people to kind of think about recognizing that there is a real need for, um, for social security, or for, pardon me, for, um, for um, paid leave for, for po folks who lack it, trying to figure out how to target aid to those people without um, disrupting the progress we see in the private sector. And, we, and then Kristen came to us, we thought it was a brilliant Thank approach. <laughs> so, that's what we've been, um, so that's what I wanted her to tell us about today and tell everybody about. Thank you. Well, the idea is pretty simple. Uh, it is 
Uh, the suggestion is to offer 12 weeks of early Social Security benefits to, on a voluntary basis to new parents after the birth or adoption of a child, and in return, uh, to offset the cost of the provision of benefits, they would agree to defer their benefits on retirement uh, and making the program overall budget neutral. So to drill down on a few specifics, um, you know, first, one great benefit is I would suggest that you be able, parents be able to stack the benefit, so moms and dads could have up to 24 weeks of caregiving for their new child, um, and you know no, it wouldn't require any additional tax or any mandate on employers. Um, and the benefits, you know, would follow the Social Security uh, benefit formula, which you know means that low-income individuals could receive up to 90% of their income uh, while they're on leave for a maximum benefit of about uh, $2,700 a year, uh, a week. I mean, a month. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the eligibility, uh, you know, I suggest that you know that parents, you know, Social Security retirement benefits, you have to have worked for at least 10 years. Obviously, most new parents don't. So there are some tweaks like, you know, suggesting that, well, maybe it's just enough that they've worked one year in their, one year in their lifetime to qualify for this. Uh, the, you know, one of the biggest issues is the deferral period. I mean, as most economists understand, and most, I think, even lay people, uh, providing benefits early on uh, costs more than providing benefits, you know, 35 years from now. Um, and so it looks like, depending on the way the program is structured, uh, the deferral period could be as low as a one-to-one -one offset, which is pretty amazing yeah. that you can get one week of early Social Security benefits and only 35 years from now have to defer retirement by one week to offset the cost. Um, so this program does not make leave free, although we, ha I mean, you have to recognize, I think we all in this room know that something that is funded by a payroll tax, you have to pay your entire working life is also not free. Uh, but it does make paid parental leave affordable for parents that lack access it, to it through their employers. And while they must ultimately pay that back by deferring their benefits, uh, I think, you know, I, being on maternity leave myself, I know that this having these, thir well, I have 13 weeks with my new son is so much more valuable to me than, you know, than being able to retire at 62 and instead of 62 and 13 weeks. Yeah. So, and, you know, just an option of providing kind of the theme here is more flexibility to better serve the American family. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's funny, as I'm gonna bring um, Lindsay Burke into this conversation. She is the director for the Center of Education um, Policy and um, Will, Will Skillman Fellow in Education at Heritage. Um, but you know, and I think as one of the, the kind of like the, the themes that I think comes from this conversation is this need to, to customize and this recognition that what everybody wants, not everybody wants the same thing and not everybody, not everything works exactly, um, uh, you know, what I, what works for me might not work for, um, for somebody else. And, um, and we're moving this way in a lot of things like paid parental leave, trying to give people more choices, let them um, customize. And I think that when I look at what's happening in education, there's a beginning of a recognition that, you know, pouring all of our resources into, into just one model for education probably isn't the best way to go. So um, Lindsay, I want to kind of start with talking about, um, you know, we we're talking about the economy changing and particularly the need for, um, for additional uh, skill development. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's going on in the higher education sector and how you yeah. think, if, is it becoming more responsive to the changing economy? <laughs> kind of. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, not really, though, right? I mean, if you look at traditional institutions of higher education, your typical colleges, universities, community colleges, they are not being responsive, or at least they're not going kicking and screaming, right? I mean, yeah. they, they really, I think, sell this ossified model. And in a way, that's, that's part of sort of what they see as virtuous, right? We've operated this way for 200 years. Why in the world would we change what we're doing, even if it's not working for the vast majority of students and families? But I think to your point, we are starting to get to a point where it's becoming untenable. The cost of college is incredibly expensive. We have seen the cost increase higher than the rate of healthcare costs over the past four decades, which is really just a breathtaking clip. And this is a cost that, by and large now, because of federal policy, is being shifted over to taxpayers, even taxpayers who have made a conscious decision that college is not the right choice for them. And I can think of no more inequitable way to finance higher education than to shift the burden of paying for it over to the truck drivers and the electricians, et cetera, who have made a decision not to pursue a bachelor's degree 
and will presumably not earn as much as their bachelor's degree going counterparts down the road. But that's what we have right now. We have a situation with federal policy where 93% of all student loans are originated in service by the federal government. And so that necessarily means that when defaults occur, when the prior administration, when the Obama administration made loan forgiveness more and more generous year after year, that that burden is being shifted onto taxpayers. And we reached a really unfortunate milestone about three weeks ago now, uh, where we hit 1.5 trillion, trillion with a T, 1.5 trillion dollars in outstanding student loan debt. I mean, that, that's just a breathtaking sum. It's more yeah. than cumulative credit card debt. But the higher ed system is just not producing what anyone would hope it would produce for that, that type of expenditure. We know that about 48% of college graduates are in occupations that don't require a college degree at all. Yeah. And so, but you know, you can hardly blame the student at that point because you have these federal policies that really create this normative idea that college is the only path to upward mobility. And so when you've got the federal imprimatur on the bachelor's degree as your only option, of course the student's going to look at that and say, well, it's a bachelor's degree or nothing. <laughs> and yeah. so you know, I think there's, there's this stigma that we have to get around to alternatives to the traditional bachelor's degree. And then a lot of it comes back to really, I would argue, eliminating a lot of the federal subsidies, federal student loans and grants to make space for private lending to reemerge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think that, that when you hear some of the, when you look at what's going on in our economy and you now see that there's all these jobs, like really good jobs out yeah. there that yeah. aren't being filled because of um, the lack of skills, you're thinking you know, something has to give. And I think yeah. the, the, the good news from what I can see is that there are some, um, a growing number of, of education providers yeah. from uh, you know, for-profit education providers, people going online that are trying to support students and get them, um, you know, start giving them alternatives to that bachelor degree. I want to quickly, Jenny, I know that, that that's something you got, you've been involved in. I'd be, love to hear yes. this is such an interesting Thank you. Thing. Yeah. That, that's fascinating, and I, it, it really kind of plays into something I was thinking about in my head as far as um, upskilling. I don't think we can overstate how important it is to upskill the next generation for whatever the, the economy's demands are, these, these job openings. And it's interesting we say about the student loan debt being so high and how it's scaring away people from pursuing a college degree. But again, some people don't need a bachelor's degree for that, right? And this is something that we've heard um, time and time again from our associates in our fulfillment centers that they either didn't have the interest in going to college or didn't have the money to go to college, but it doesn't take away this importance for upskilling. So what we did is create this program called Career Choice, which um, is 95% prepaid tuition for associates who've worked with us for a year to enter into a certification program for one of the um, in-demand jobs in a particular metro area. We use BLS stats to figure out what those uh, jobs are. It's nursing, it's commercial truck driving, it's computer science, it's a, it's a, whole, host, a whole host depending on the particular metro area. Um, and been a, a really great success story for us, and um, I think it's something that we, as a you know, as society and as employers, have to look at as far as upskilling what we're going to do. Yeah, it's such an interesting. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's such an interesting um, like benefit to offer offer mm -hmm. um, employees. But obviously, Lindsay, one of the problems is we're talking about this. You're thinking, you know, we can't just focus on what getting to higher education. They can't do everything. One of the big problems is is the K through 12 system that we have this tremendous investment. If you look at the numbers, it's some jaw dropping numbers on how much invested through. Um, um, and K through 12, um, are we getting our money's worth? And if not, what are what reforms are, would you think are the, the best right. way to improve what, the, what K through 12 is delivering? So we're definitely not getting our money's worth. So we're sitting here in DC. DC proper is one of the worst offenders of this lack of return on investment for high levels of spending. I mean, if you wanted to see the prime example of how spending has little if any correlation with academic achievement, it's DC. If you are an entering kindergarten student, child, in DC public schools, by the time you graduate, if you graduate, uh, we have spent, taxpayers have spent almost $400,000 on that child in DCPS. I mean, that, that's a breathtaking sum. Yeah. And yet, they have graduation rates that are abysmally low, academic achievement outcomes as measured by the National Assessment of Educational Progress are incredibly low as well, particularly for low-income and minority children. You know, it's hard not to think, well, wow, I mean, if we gave parents control over that $400,000, I bet they could get their kids to read <laughs> by the time they graduate. I mean, DC, kids are leaving without being remotely proficient in reading yeah. as high school awful. seniors. It's really awful. So 
you know, we know from DC and lots of other sites across the country that there's very little correlation between spending and academic achievement, but there is correlation between who controls those dollars and the academic outcomes that we see. And so if we look at, just quickly, all of the, and by all, there are only 17 that exist, experimental random assignment evaluations of the effect of school choice. We see that outcomes are really strong. Um, 15 out of 17 find either positive or neutral effects, and only two of these studies have ever found a negative effect as a result of participating in an education choice program. And those two were in uniquely strict regulatory environments. And so we know from the academic literature that school choice works when you empower parents. But even more importantly, I would argue, than the academic outcomes is when you talk to parents, they're just happy their kids are safe. I mean, that is the first thing when you talk to a parent that they will say is they're trying to exercise choice to make sure that their child is safe. And then they move to, you know, does my child have a teacher who knows his name and smiles at him when he comes to school in the morning? And then the academic outcomes. But that is the beautiful thing about choice is that all of those benefits accrue as a result of putting parents in the driver's seat. Well, yeah, that's a, that's, it's really interesting to think of how, um, you know, it's funny when I, yeah. you, there's almost no other model <laughs> where, yeah. um, where we accept this idea that we just have to take whatever's given to us for a yeah. service. And it's very strange to think of, of having to accept service, you know, without having, without having choice. Yeah. And yet we accept that as the norm for, for education. Well, and, and thinking about Amazon, right? I mean, Amazon has changed our lives, right? Yeah. And I mean, technology <laughs> has changed our lives. And I, I was uh, giving a talk last night, and there was a great little meme floating around a couple of months ago where it said, you know, think about how you interacted with the internet 20 years ago in 1998. What did people tell you? They said, whatever you do, don't meet strangers from the internet, don't get in their cars. <laughs> but what do we do today, right? <laughs> we literally summon strangers from the internet and we get into their cars, <laughs> right? That's so funny. So, you know, I mean, technology has just changed the way that, you know, it's changed every aspect of our lives, the way that, that we interact, and yet, K-12 education in particular has been uh, resistant to that. I mean, it operates much more like the DMV than it does Amazon. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I, would, I know we've got some great folk, people in the crowd, so I want to, um, does anyone have any questions? I mean, I can keep going with questions to these folks, but if you guys have anything on either um, the, tech, the technology's influence, education, paid leave, please. Hi, I'm Jill Turgeon. I serve on the Loudoun County School Board. And Kristen, I was really intrigued with what you were talking about with paid leave because this is something that we were approached with a couple of weeks ago, and it's just been put on our agenda. And um, I found it very intriguing, the model that you're looking at to be able to make that cost neutral. Is that something that you think that could be applied at a local level? Um, we've got, you know, in Virginia, we have um, a self-funded retirement and self-funded health care. Um, so I don't know if you have any knowledge on how that might be able to be applied at a local level. I think it, it could be applied certainly to um, state employees with you know state pensions. You know, and teachers are a huge constitute a huge group um, there. And so as as anywhere you have basically some sort of retirement benefit that someone could voluntarily. Uh, choose to defer to have early benefits, then this concept would work. Um, and there are actually a small handful of states that don't participate in Social Security uh, for their state employees. And so this would be something that if they wanted to adopt this model that could only be done at the state level for, for those individuals. Oh, please do. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're hoping. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's why you're here today. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything? Because, you know, I think that's something worth, worth lingering, lingering on. You know, it's interesting because I think that when we're, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about talking about what Kristen's um, approach was this idea of recognizing what government's already out there doing and how much government is already um, uh, kind of um, the, the resources that are available if we start um, it, it, the real question isn't about growing government, it's about making government smarter. And when you think about something like Social Security, and I'm sure it's the same with a, a state and local level, that we do have, um, you know, we have a big, big chunk of change. And that's also with, uh, um, with K, K through 12. Um, you know, where are there on states, Lindsay, where they are starting to kind of return those, those dollars to parents to have a bigger... Yeah, yeah, yeah. so absolutely. Uh, if you look back to about... If you look back to the year 2000, there were 10 private school choice programs in operation. So voucher programs and ESAs, or ESAs, and tax credit scholarships primarily. There are no ESAs, education savings accounts at that point. 
If you fast forward, so that was 20, 2,000, about 10 programs. If you fast forward today, we have 63 private school choice programs in over half of states and the district. So just dramatic growth over the past two decades. Um, I mentioned ESAs a second ago. This is the direction the education choice debate is going. I mean, we, we rarely even say school choice anymore because it is so much more personalized and customizable. When you think about a traditional school voucher model, which is a great model, a lot of states have, have implemented voucher models today, a school voucher is basically a coupon to attend a single private school of choice and offset the cost of tuition. That's awesome. An education savings account, though, is a real refinement on that voucher model. What an ESA does, you get a portion, Arizona was the first state to adopt it, you get 90% of what the state would have spent on your kid in the public system so just the state funds. It goes into an account in Arizona. It literally goes onto a debit card that the parent controls. And you can then use that debit card to finance private school tuition, online learning, special education <coughs> services and therapies. You can have private tutors come straight to your home, uh, textbooks, curricula. You can even roll over unused funds year to year. So if you think about a voucher, sort of like a coupon, the ESA is much more like an Amazon gift card <laughs> where you can direct yeah. <laughs> services, it all comes back, <laughs> to, to multiple products and providers. And so now, now we have six states that have ESAs in place, which is just incredible growth because 2011 was the, the first year that we ever had an ESA in place. I'll just say one other thing on that. Um, it, I think we have to mention Milton Friedman's impact on the, the school choice uh, conversation. And he had a really, if you've never seen it before, I think it's just a really great framework for how people spend money. And so he, what he said, Friedman said, you've basically got four ways you can spend money. You can spend your own money on yourself, you can spend somebody else's money on somebody else, you can spend somebody else's money on yourself, or you can spend somebody else's money on somebody else. <laughs> How do public schools spend money, right? They spend somebody else's money, your taxpayer dollars, on somebody else's kids. So they have no incentive to economize or to maximize value. ESAs get us much closer to spending your own money. Yes, it's the state per pupil funds, but your own money on your own kids. So you have every incentive to economize, to maximize value, and ultimately to find what is the right fit for your kid, which I think is what the Ed Choice movement's all about. Yeah, it's interesting when you think about about you know when I, when I Jenny when we think about um, you know, I think that we know as kind of consumers what technology has done so that you know before I had to go and say okay I'm going to go to my local store and this is what I can buy where now you have access through online through on flat platforms like Amazon to not only all these products but all these different sellers and small businesses. When you think about it with education, it is. Is interesting to think you know, there should be my goodness like what is like there's this ton of money out there and in the world of education um, there should be a lot of people who want to, um, to provide those yeah. educational services but there's been this kind of disconnect or we haven't kind of unleashed that power of the market which really could be transformative so does anybody else have any any questions to bring in yes Shana thank you Thank you. Um, have, has there been any testing to see the efficacy of the Arizona program? Do we see what, of the what's ESA going on? option? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, we have 17 experimental evaluations of school choice programs. Those have only been conducted on uh, not education savings accounts, tax credit scholarships, and voucher programs to date. That's a function of a couple of issues. One, ESAs are relatively new, so we don't have you know the cohorts of kids who are there haven't you know been tested frequently, but also with the state programs, and I think this is a virtue and not a bug, there are not requirements for these students to take the same tests that the public school kids have to take. And that's really important, I'll just really quickly on that. Louisiana has a statewide voucher program in place, which is fantastic, it's great that they did that. When they did that, they required all of their participating private schools to take the exact same state tests that the district schools take, Principals worried that that would drive their curriculum, their school culture. They don't allow parents to top off their voucher amount. So if there's a delta between the voucher amount and tuition, parents can't pay out of pocket. So basically they enacted price controls. So they put all of these regulations in place in Louisiana. The result was only a third of private schools participate. Some evidence suggests they were already experiencing attrition prior to program entry, suggesting they were the poor quality private schools. And so Louisiana is one of those two evaluations that had negative effects. That's a long story to say there aren't testing outcome or requirements on any of the six ESA programs that are state testing mandates. There is a nationally norm reference requirement for some of them, which doesn't drive curriculum and culture. 
uh, but we don't have any of the outcomes yet on that. What we do have are very happy parents. We have a lot of parental satisfaction surveys of ESA families, and to me, that's that's one of the most important factors we can look at. Yeah. Is there one question? One another other question yeah. on, on education. Is there what about on a, a federal level? Because because uh, I know that um, we're here in Washington, and I feel like so much of the education battle kind of takes place in the states. But um, is there kind of a push to move uh, ESAs? The <laughs> there is a push. <laughs> uh, whether or not it's a good idea at the federal level is an open debate. I mean, sure. ultimately, we want these programs to be housed at the most local level possible for good governance reasons, uh, for you know, ensuring that we don't have overregulation, et cetera. But there are a couple of things, one in particular, that the federal government can do uh, that's totally appropriate, and that would be to provide education savings accounts for military-connected kids. Okay. This is something that we've been working on at Heritage uh, for about a year and a half now. I think it's really good policy. National security is an enumerated power of the federal government. It's the reason why there's a special place for military kids at the Department of Ed for their education. And so we've proposed basically transitioning that funding, modernizing it into a system of ESA so that it functions more like the GI Bill does for service members. So that would be appropriate. Anything in the district, the District of Columbia is under the jurisdiction of Congress. We think we should transition that into an all-choice district. Sure. Yeah. That's terrific. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll go ahead and, and thank my panelists for, um, for their time and their expertise. And everybody will take a quick break before we um, head on to the, the health care discussion. And then um, we'll, you know, we'll move on from there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.